Yu, um, she is a Haas alum and she's the owner of a tea shop, Tents, on 4th Street. Um, and they source from their tea from independent farms all over China, Japan, and Taiwan. Um, when he's a head buyer and she spent over two decades seeking out the best craft people in the industry. Um, she also has another business that we'll learn more about today. Um, so yeah, we can welcome her to class. Okay, so no business terms discussed today, right? It's too boring. <laughs> no talks of VCs and things like that. Okay, I only have one slide on that. So. Well, hello everyone. My name is Winnie Yu. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, we actually teach off and on a decal class that's on tea. And we teach it at our tea shop, so I'm familiar with the decal format. Um, before I start, do you guys have any particular requests on what you want to hear about today? Not that I would address them necessarily, but any, anything? I know you've had speakers every week, so any particular topics or subjects that you may want to know? Okay. Yes? Um, I'm curious to hear about how you move on to, like, adventures, for example, like, Tian's the Hot Dog, or on or like you guys have, uh, oh, she knows a lot about my business already. So. so I didn't want to scare you guys, but entrepreneurship the hard way, that's my topic. And I want to stress that um, while I was at Haas, I did not take the entrepreneurial class. <laughs> I should have. I thought I was going to work in the corporate world forever. And I did that for a decade and decided that it would be a lot more fun if I had my own business because for a number of reasons, which many of you probably have thought of, uh, when you work in a corporate setting, your contribution is relatively limited and you're sometimes not sure what you're contributing to. Um, are you making a difference? Are you just lining up somebody's pocket or you're doing something mildly unethical because of accounting procedures? Do you remember, guys remember Anderson Cooper? Um, so there's a lot of um, doubts in my mind after a decade of working in the corporate world that led me to explore the entrepreneurial side of business, which means basically you, yourself, slaving 12 hours a day or more. And so that was the part that uh, they didn't, I didn't take the class in business school, so I encourage all of you to do that before you uh, embark on it. Because basically you're setting up a small business to start, which hopefully will grow into a large business, right? Or you might want to keep it at a small business. It just depends on what you want to do. So I decided to create my first business, which was a completely unique business in many ways. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And it's Tions. It's my, uh, my tea company. It's not just a tea company. It's a very high-end tea shop plus selection of some of the top foremost highest-end, most prestigious, most award-winning teas in the world. So if you're not familiar with tea, you think about, well, what's the big deal about tea, right? Oops. Because most of you have had tea bags, and you know, tea in a bag is very exciting. You don't know what's inside, right? Do you, do you guys actually know what's inside the tea bag? This is not a lecture about tea, but I love talking about what's inside a tea bag. Have you guys ever like ripped a tea bag open? And what do you think it is? A lot of times I think it's like the, uh, the smaller pieces of tea that sort of fall out when making higher end tea. Because it's in the bag, no one knows like whether it's like the full leaf or just tiny like yeah. shape almost. Yeah, exactly. It's called tea fanning. So it's when you're producing tea in a factory and you blow a fan and all the refuse particles go to a corner. So that's called fanning. So that's what goes into a tea bag. So, you know, Lipton's, let's not name names, but they do own 50% <laughs> of the market. Um, you know, they pay virtually nothing, de minimis. So it's in their best interest to sell a lot of tea bags and to have the consumer think that, you know, tea is basically a tea bag. Um, it's, it fits in line with our culture of convenient foods, definitely. It's very much the same as you go to McDonald's, you don't really know what's in that burger either. I mean, do you? So, you know. If you read Michael Pollan's book, you'll find out that 
<coughs> probably the uh, the smoky the smokiness of the burger is not actually smoky. It's not smoked. It's actually from some kind of sauce, chemical sauce that they apply. And the beef is 100% beef, but it could be all parts of the beef. So cow lips would be one of them, right? So same as tea bags. You don't really know what's inside a tea bag, but this is a huge industry. Um, I, you know, from market research, it's between a 50 to 100 billion dollar industry, and it's most likely a 100 billion dollar industry because Lipton's is at 50 billion. So it can't possibly be a 50 billion industry. Now, a lot of people drink tea in the world. Uh, we don't drink so much tea in this country. This is a coffee country, uh, the Americas. But all of Europe, right, the British have 11 tea times. They do. High, high tea, low tea, pre-breakfast tea, breakfast tea, uh, 11 seeds. I don't even know all the names, but 11 tea times. And uh, so Northern Africa, they all drink tea. All of the... Uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries like Turkey, everything happens around a tea house. You know, all the news reports happen in an Iraqi tea house or a Turkish tea house. Uh, all of Asia, um, many parts of Eastern Europe, which is, uh, Czechoslovakia, etc., uh, Soviet bloc. So most of the world actually drinks tea, and we're just not so familiar with it. So the worldwide industry is 100 billion. So with that information, I thought, great, <laughs> I can open my tea business. I just need. 0.001% of the 10, the one, the what, 100 billion dollars? <laughs> that, you know, that's a good thought, right? But, of course, I wasn't going to be selling tea bags. I mean, tea bags was, while I was at uh, school here at UC Berkeley, actually, that was one of the more traumatic events that happened to me was to be away from home for the first time and finding out that all I get were tea bags, that I was not going to be drinking, you know, those kind of teas. They were at my parents' house. So all I could get were Earl Grey or mint or chamomile in a tea bag in the corner of a cafe. That was very traumatic. And I couldn't understand that other people didn't drink real tea, that everybody else drank tea bag tea. So that let me, that kind of haunted me for a long time. So after I graduated from school and I was able to travel to Asia, I picked up my hobby of learning about tea and drinking tea and going to a lot of mountains and seeking out tea. But at that time, it was just a hobby. It was just so I can satisfy myself with getting some of those top grade teas and bringing them back in suitcases, sharing them with my friends. By the way, that's what a tea leaf looks like. So that is hardly tea, okay, what's in a tea bag? Um, a tea leaf has some of the, is one of the top superfoods, okay, has high as antioxidants, polyphenols, um, over 300 aromatic essential oils, so an extremely complex tea leaf that produces High concentration of aromas. Who's interested in food and beverage in this group here? Not just high tech. Okay, great. Well, we're sort of in a, a food-centric uh, uh, Bay Area, right? Bay Area is pretty is a foodie town. We have lots of farmers markets and interest in high-quality foods. So I'm happy to be in the Bay Area. Otherwise, you know, there would be no market. Everybody would be drinking tea bags. Um, the level of tea that I'm talking about are similar to the high-end wines in Napa. So imagine if you lived your whole life, are you guys drinking age? Okay. So imagine if you had to live your whole life in a country of Tupac Chuck and maybe chili and wine. <coughs> right? No French wines, no Italian wines, and no Napa Valley. That would not be very happy. So that's kind of was my situation. So I created this tea shop uh, for a number of reasons, and one of them is to obviously to introduce these high-end teas, much like our Napa quality wines. Of course, they're you know, not so great wines in Napa too, but we're talking about, you know, 90 point above wines, that quality of teas, okay, that you don't find in this country. I actually literally have to do the legwork to import those teas myself. After, you know, a decade of roaming around and, you know, seeking these teas as a hobby, so this is the result. You can go down to 4th Street and visit it any time. I also created a tea bar. Let's see where that is. That tea bar there. And that's for uh, tea tasting. So similar to wine tasting, I figured that one of the concepts was people need to taste these teas to learn about them, to find out there's a whole new world besides your tea bag teas and tasteless teas or things that are not tea inside your tea bag teas. So I set up a tea bar with 
flight tasting. So you're tasting teas in flights similar to the wine model. Now I had to model myself after the wine industry a little bit because I looked around to see what tea businesses I could model after. And what did I get? What are some tea businesses you guys are aware of? Tivana. Tivana. At that time, at, at, when I started this, it was 2002. <coughs> and I was out at Pete's. And that was about it. Yeah, Pete's Tea and Coffee. Mr. Pete, actually, I knew him. He was a, a big fan of tea. So, you know, I could, this is a passion project. Okay? So, uh, an entrepreneurial passion project. And a passion project, to me, the definition of that is a business that you would do no matter what the obstacles were because you believe so strongly in your product. Now, when you start a business, it's much easier if you plug into networks or existing businesses or existing markets. Well, because it's much easier, right? You have an existing market, you just have to promote your own product. Um, or there's already enough of those products in your product is just better and you're able to communicate that, you're able to market that. But I found that I had to actually create my own market. So fast. I had to create my own market because people were so far from tasting any real teas, okay? So they were so far, their only experience with tea was with tea bags and thinking that tea was a 10 cent matter, not a hundred dollar a pound tea or a thousand dollar a pound tea. Okay? That, those are the going prices in my shop. So you can pick up a, a bag of two ounce tea for thirty dollars. <coughs> Easily. That's that's kind of the average price. And you, similarly you can go to a wine shop and you can pick up a bottle of wine for thirty dollars or fifty or a hundred. Right? Or a thousand. Or a million dollars. I mean that was one of the more, most expensive wines ever ever sold. Um, so I had to create that market, you know, leading the consumer from a 10 cent tea bag to a $30 two ounce bag of tea. So creating your own market is difficult. And you could say that it's a pioneering sort of effort. Also, you know, not only tea, but you know, how to make the tea. It's a little bit of cooking, right? You, how, how do you make this tea? You dip your tea bag in hot water, well, okay, well, what are the accoutrements or the tools or the devices that you need to actually make this tea? If some of you cook, should be, making tea should be very easy, but if you're only used to convenient foods and the only thing you've ever done in your life is open a wrapper, it's going to be very hard for you to make a cup of tea, even though all it takes is actually just steeping in hot water. So, you know, teapots and cups and, you know, people are like, well, how do I make this cup of tea? I have a saucepan. What else do I need? You need a kettle and a cup, maybe, and a teapot, you know, basic stuff. So curating all of those products for my shop um, so that it's not too strange, it's user friendly, and that people can get, all, get, you know, get through it pretty quickly so they can enjoy the tea. But then once they purchase that tea, you don't know what they do with it at home. Are they cooking it right? Are they steeping it right? You don't know. So it's kind of like, you know, you have your top chef with their recipes, but when you go to make that, it's that dish, it's probably not as good as the top chef's version, right? Anyway, that's uh, where, where do I, what do I have to do to get those teas, okay? The, the main focus of my shop and my business is the top teas in the world. How does one find the top teas in the world? You can't look it up in Wikipedia, okay? A lot of these tea farms are extremely far, extremely remote. You're lucky if there's actually a paved road that goes in the, into it. We're talking about little esoteric villages that have been around for a thousand years, literally, um, generation after generation. We're talking about trees or tea trees that have, that are a couple thousand years old, that are out in the wild in the bottom of China, that, you know, on the jungle somewhere, you have to explore. I feel like an Indiana Jones after a while. Right, you go into these remote places with no plumbing or electric, you know, you're eating with the farmers and they're just cooking it in some big old stone hearth thing. Um, and they ask you, you know, what would you like to eat today? We'll kill the pig for you. Like, okay, maybe not. 
Um, that uh, mud, large structure there, that was one of the um, tea houses or a tea mansion, the, uh, the mansion of a very wealthy tea merchant from um, almost 1,600 years ago. Okay, so uh, tea's been around for 4,500 years, give or take, about the age of the Jewish calendar, I heard. Uh, pretty old. It was first discovered as a medicine, and it then became a very well-known beverage in Asia. And so this is an established product, tea, in Asia. This is an established product in Europe since the 1600s. It is just not existent in this country. Uh, this is Taiwan, one of the places that I go to seek tea. And, uh, you know, most tea mountains are very beautiful, so I can't say that it's all, you know, bugs and, and hot weather and treacherous roads. Uh, most of the places that I go to are actually quite beautiful. So, you know, I never take vacation anymore. I just go tea buying. <laughs> Correction, I don't have the luxury of time to take any vacation anymore, so I only go tea buying. What does it take to choose the top teas? Well, you're the tea buyer. You better know what to choose. The thing is, tea is extremely competitive in Asia. The high-end teas are extremely competitive. So we're not talking about manufacturing here. You don't get to control the people who produce these teas. They're independent. Uh, they own their farms. They're artisans. They're very well regarded. They might be award-winning masters. Who wouldn't give you the time of day if you can't tell the difference between that, that, or that? Do they look exactly the same to you? They taste almost exactly the same as well. Can you tell the difference when you taste the, the, the brewed tea? And if you can, you pass, you might be able to buy their top teas. If you can't, they'll, they'll give you the bottom teas for the top price. Like that? How do you develop the palate for tea at that level? Okay? That's the trade secret. I can't, I can't disclose that. <laughs> it took me 20 years. So. Um, a lot of tea tasting. Sometimes I would be at a farm and taste 200 batches of the exact same tea made at different hours. They're exactly the same, but made maybe slightly different people, slightly different hands, different conditions. It might be sunnier when this batch was made. It might be a little more roasty when that tea was made. So you taste through 200 of those to choose one lot or you choose none of them at all in one morning sitting. Okay, so. The job of a tea buyer in picking your product, and this is just one farm, okay? We, we have over 65 plus farms that we buy from. So it's very strenuous. You, your palate has to be really fine-tuned, so it's very similar to being a wine sommelier. And so with that format, we often have uh, events where we invite Napa or Sonoma wine sommeliers to come down and taste tea, see if they can taste the difference, and then if they can, um, lend me their vocabulary because they're so expert in describing, you know, this tea tastes like sunset on the beach with some pebbles, and it just rained on the pebbles. <laughs> that sounds really good. I'm going to use that for marketing. <laughs> so wine sommelier is really good, well trained in the vocabulary of tasting. And so we often work together uh, to help this tea effort because, again, the wine industry is much closer to what I'm trying to do and much less about the tea bag type convenient teas. So seeking out you know, similar businesses. Uh, finding the top tea masters in the world, that particular tea that you see the, that uh, uh, one master making, she's one of nine people that can make that tea. It's a green tea that's shaped like a needle and it's hair size. And it has to be done by hand. And that particular hot walk there is, uh, I think it's 80 degrees Celsius. So what is that? Do you guys know? Fahrenheit? 100, 200? Almost 200. About 200, right? Yeah, 200 Fahrenheit. So she's got her bare hands making this tea. From, from, uh, from fresh plucking to all the way to dry finished product in one hour. Her hands end up with blisters at the end. She's one of nine people in the world that can make this tea. And the other gentleman there, he's one of the top Dragon Well uh, tea masters. Have you guys heard of this tea called Dragon Well? Anyone has ever heard of any teas in here? Pick the wrong speaker. 
Um, Dragon Ball is one of the emperor's teas. It's a tribute tea. They used to only tribute it to the emperor, and common people can't, couldn't drink it. And so the tea masters who made this tea, basically they typed it to the, the, the emperor. Uh, so he's also, that, that walk there is about 100 degrees Celsius. So I'm making this tea. And uh, the harvest is coming up in about 20 days for that particular tea, and I have to be in competition to buy those teas because that tea exists only in one place in China, in Hangzhou. And literally people roll up in their Rolls Royces, okay, to buy this tea, put it in the trunk, drive off, and give it to the government officials. That's how they grease the palms in China when they're doing business. You gotta give the top teas. That's just the custom, that's the culture. And if they're $20,000 a pound, great. Their business will be smooth sailing that year. So the more expensive the tea, the more demand there is. So I have to compete with those. Now, which consumer in the US is gonna pay $20,000 for tea? You don't have to know anything about tea to say, Probably no one. Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, in terms of the prices uh, for high MT in the U.S., what like about what of that, what percentage of the cost is actually importing into the U.S., and what percentage is what's actually ending up in the growers and the merchants' hands? Yeah, um, very good question. So we buy from directly from the from the growers. So it's whatever the growers will charge. Um, at this level of tea, there's almost no negotiation because there's so much demand and so much competition, you're lucky to even get, get the seed. Um, I would say that about one-fifth is the farm price, and about another one-fifth is just the importation cost, getting through all of the red tape of getting teas out of certain countries, and all the shipping costs and everything else. Yep. So, you know, yes. Uh, I was gonna say, sorry, I was gonna say, despite the popularity, why do you think it's still so rare to like, get these teas? You know, why hasn't it been scaled up to create larger batches? In this country? Uh, no, in China. Oh, in China. Well, a lot of these teas are handmade. Mm -hmm. So, one, imagine a mountain. The land mass on the top of the mountain is relatively yeah. small. So, the top, top, peak, highest elevation teas are the best. And the bottom, you know, landfill teas are probably going to be the worst. So to get the top of the line tea, you want to get the top of the mountain teas. So very limited production, limited agriculture, and then you have shrinkage. So you have to pick 30,000 to 40,000 little tea buds to make a pound of tea by hand. So there's labor, and then there's the artisans who can actually execute. And there's you know a limited number of those people. So. Um, the very, very top end teas, like wine, is not scalable. So I picked a limited audience business. I picked a niche business that, you know, a market that I have to create. I picked a limited supply business. What do you guys think? <laughs> um, is there a question over there? Wait, the, the wait? Oh, yeah. Um, I want to know, like, yeah, like, what you're going about to say, like, why did you decide, to, despite all these barriers, why did you decide to pursue um, this business, despite the fact it was your passion project. Passion project, uh, challenge, really bored with corporate business. <laughs> um, do something no one's ever done before. Do something that you uniquely are qualified to do that no one else can do. Because again, it takes your connections to all the farms, finding all those tea masters that I've already found by the time I started the business. Um, having the power to discern what are the top teas and what are the right <coughs> prices for those teas. Um, because it's always a test. They will always test you at every time. You will always get a test to see if you knew exactly what level of the tea that they served you and what the price should be every time. Go on. Did you say that uh, the, uh, like, one that is uh, going to farms and all of the rest of the No, just another fifth. Oh, okay. Yeah, the rest are doing business in the U.S. Okay. Yeah, and, very expensive. Um, I was curious, with the local farms and at the U.S. Uh, seller, do they kind of differentiate between like selling to local Chinese people, the Chinese businesses, or selling overseas? <coughs> and if, um, 
if there is, is does contract farming the same principles apply to the T So two questions. But back to the uh, question about you know how much of it is farm price. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you had middlemen involved, right? Because most tea houses buy from middlemen, from importers. So we're already acting as our own importer because we're buying farm direct. Imagine if you were buying from a tea shop that had middlemen, then it'll be ten times. So they'll be paying one tenth. So therefore, their teas cannot, you know, first of all, be at the level that our teas are. They have to be at least half the price and therefore have the quality, or less. So bear that in mind. Okay, so your question was, uh, do they discriminate against uh, selling overseas versus to their local buyers? Um, often they do, because it's much more to their political advantage to be able to sell to their local politicians and corporates. That one, you know, they, they're very discerning, they have the money, they understand that it needs to uh, be at that certain price, they'll never negotiate. And selling to a foreigner really has no advantage to them. So you have to have a pretty pretty good relationship with all of these farmers. And I've known them for many years, so I'm almost like a local for them. You know, I can speak the language. And I bring the kids chocolate. You know, that usually helps because chocolate's rare. Good chocolate is a rare commodity in a lot of Asian countries. And um, then I bring the farmers wine, you know, here, it's right in Napa. So I bring them good wine and they give me good tea, so it's all good. So we have different relationship building type thing, ways that you know improve, and that's not so cut and dry as business. A lot of farmers are not all about business. Um, so having a really good relationship with your, your vendors really help. Uh, your other question was... Um, contract farming? Um, contract farming? Um, generally, a lot of these farms are really old and have been around. The best tea farms have been around for centuries not decades. So contract farming would mean open up a new plot of land and somewhere that may or may not be suitable for growing tea. And that happens. A lot of organic teas are grown that way. The concept of organic has never occurred in Asia because it was always organic until the idea of organic came around, right? Because why wouldn't they be organic? They were never industrialized in the first place. They couldn't even afford pesticides, for example. So they use um, manure for uh, fertilizer, not chemical fertilizers. They've always used manure. So when, <coughs> at what point do they need to become organic? You know, so um, a lot of these modern agricultural terms don't apply to an industry as old as this. So contract farming is kind of the same. Um, you have to open up a plot of land to grow this new tea. And you have to find some, not the top artisans, because they won't leave their own farms. So trainees or you know secondary type artisans. Does that answer your question? So they don't really do it. Uh, they do, but not often. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was wondering about working between countries. How do you pay attention to currency changing, or like how does that factor in, or do you really not worry about something? Oh, I worry about it every day. <laughs> every day. <laughs> I worry about currency exchanges, and when I'm at the farm, I have to worry about uh, conversions. One of the most painful is from U.S. to metric. I have to do that in my head constantly. Like when they quote me a price, that's metric, and then they have their local pounds and you know their their system. And you have to convert that. So, for example, in China, they use uh, 500 grams as their pound, and one kilo is 1,000. Right? So it's all good, but then when you go to Taiwan, it's 1.3 pound, 1.3 jin per pound. So their pound is 1.3 pounds. So you're constantly doing this conversion in your mind, plus the currency exchange of the day. So Taiwan is between 31 to 32 Taiwanese dollars to the dollar, and then you have to convert that against, well, China is currently at 6.8 something Chinese dollars per dollar, so how does that compare with the Taiwanese price? You have to do that quick math. So I hope you guys are good at math. You know, starting your own business. Um, you know, having your iPhone helps, but you look really lame if you have to do that. Um, one of some of the other difficulties I face is, you know, the best teas are grown on mountains like that. 
And uh, I, I got shaky leg climbing that vertical cliff there, so I didn't do it. I just took a picture. But uh, you know, these all mountains that I've climbed. Uh, a lot of the teas are grown on uh, elevations of, let's see, 1,000 meters or higher, 1,000 to 2,000 meters. So definitely 6,000 feet ish. Right? And a lot of times they just come out of nowhere, they're like a vertical cliff. It's, uh, the, the best teas are grown on slopes that are incredibly challenging, like these hills are easily, the best teas are 45 degree, going on 45 degree slopes. And then the even better ones are the 60 degree slopes. So they will price their teas according to elevation and slope. So if your teas grow on 2,000 meters on a 60 degree slope, you can add top dollar. Especially if it's covered in dense fog, in which case you can slip and fall. I'm so amazed I'm still alive. <laughs> yes? It's not really a business thing, but can you give us some insight into how that's like priced? I mean, why is that better? Why is the tea better if it's grown on like a 70 degree angle? Oh, okay. Uh, the tea plant does not like uh, pooling water. It actually it doesn't like drenching rain, pooling water. So the best teas like a little bit of drizzle from the fog, and then fog needs to dissipate and, and sunlight needs to happen. It's pretty fickle that way, so only certain climates are really, really suitable. So the more drainage you have, the steeper your hill, the better it is. Um, so that brings you the question of a lot of organic teas are grown in flat areas because nobody's going to give up their steep hill size for your organic tea. So a lot of the organic teas actually, people are like, why do organic teas not taste better than these teas? And I have to tell them, well, non-organic teas are grown on flat areas. At the bottom of the hill, where all the runoff from all the water drainage comes running down, everybody's laundry goes down to the bottom of the hill. And you have aerial pollution, right, on top of everything. So these are some of the uh, more scenic areas in Taiwan and China that I go to on a regular basis, like next month. And I have to battle through, you know, some of these guys that are almost, this is almost like life size. I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're almost life size. If you can see them uh, actually killing a sparrow and wrapping it up, um, I deal with a lot of these kind of creatures in tea farms. So, uh, yeah, it's a very different proposition than setting up a nice factory and just producing stuff. And then you have to spend all this time educating the consumer, too. You know, just like what I've just said here. And even a simple question well, why are these teas better? And what criteria? Why, does, why is this tea a thousand dollars a pound? Okay. And so we have a lot of tea education classes. We taught uh, three years worth of tea decal. Yeah, my staff taught them, I only taught one. And then I gave a final and nobody wanted to come. <laughs> <laughs> then I learned that there's no finals in the decal classes. <laughs> um, so at the end of the day, I just need a cocktail. <laughs> That was a lot of work, right? You guys get tired of just listening to it, right? A lot of legwork, and that was just, what I walked you through was just the sourcing part of it. Okay? And then the marketing, and then the development of your, your consumer base, and the communications part of it is very, very important. How do you communicate this high end tea product in a world that has none of this tea product? You borrow from wine terms, but, you know, wine's made from a grape. So, Teas from the week. You're still talking about different things. Any questions so far on my first business? It's still in existence, of course. You can go and visit. Uh, yes. How did you get in contact with those rural um, vendors? Because they are so far out and limited. Like, how did you make that connection? It takes many years and a lot of traveling. So, uh, for example, I would know a tea master, and I, I'm interested in going to a particular famous tea mountain, not knowing anyone there. I would try to get an introduction from one tea master from a different mountain to find someone in that other mountain. And from there, I try to find some other tea masters from that mountain. And then you just spend a lot of time tasting through you know, everybody's production, and you gradually develop relationships. So it takes decades. Yeah. Yes? So you talked about like creating your market. Um, who is your... Your, your market and how did you create it? So that's a very interesting um, question and, and one of the probably biggest obstacles to my business proposition was well, how do you develop a market? Who is your target market? 
you, it can't be just tea drinkers because tea drinkers are used to their tea bags, right? And converting them from a 10 cent tea bag to a thousand dollar pound tea is rather difficult. It's a big paradigm shift. So I looked at being in the Bay Area, we have a huge foodie community. People believe in $20 bottles of jam and certainly, you know, $50 bottles of honey, uh, $5 avocado, because they recognize the value of an artisan food. So that's the market. The artisan food community is the market. People who appreciate fine foods and gourmet foods and handmade foods, um, better quality, things that they can't find anywhere else. Uh, the wine community, again, is, is a very strong one for us in terms of the parallels between people that have the palate to appreciate wine, they can also appreciate tea at this level. So those were my top target markets. And cultivating though, those basically involves a lot of tastings, a lot of events, a lot of education. Yeah, And pulling in the wine somali has really helped too. There's a question, no more questions? Okay. Yes. So um, you mentioned you are on 4th Street, which based on like that target market, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, but like, I I'm curious, like, did you know from the beginning that you had to be in a place like, like that with like higher end shops and like wealthier consumers, but like the rent, I'm, so I'm, my question, I guess the rent is probably a lot higher there. Absolutely. We, you're yeah. paying top dollar rent and your consumer base there is uh, relatively affluent and, you know, although we get a lot of students, we get a ton of students all the time because your sit down pot of tea is, I think we charge seven to ten dollars a pot, so it's like right in the price range of everything else. Um, we get a lot of professors. Um, so a lot of demographic there, you know, a lot of shoppers from Marin, et cetera, that come down to the street. And, but we notice that we've developed our own following, so people come, there are people that come daily, people that come weekly, people that come monthly, people that come, if they come to the Bay Area once a year, they would be sure to visit us, you know, that type of loyal following. So over the years, you know, we've gotten a pretty nice community. So in the interest of time, I better move on to um, the business that I'm currently developing. So the other one is a more mature business. Uh, this one I'm, I'm in the middle of developing. So Fog Dog is a uh, beverage company. So I contemplated, you know, okay, well, I did the passion project, so what about more normal business that actually has ma mass marketing? <coughs> and, you know, organic growth for the tea shop, you know, grow it slowly, go over a decade, or it has an accelerated trajectory. You can just place this product everywhere and can blanket the country in, in a relatively short time. Um, you have a lot of market prestige with what I do with Teons, right? With that level of tea, but what about market impact? You can get, for a $5 bottle of tea, you can get a lot of people to consume this in a very fast way. Limited supply, which is what I dealt with with Teons, right? Versus unlimited production, okay? The next business is in, in production. And um, organic branding versus professional branding. So branding is very important because it's all about that, right? You guys see something and you recognize the brand and for some reason you just think you have to buy it. <coughs> you have no idea what the value is, but the brand, the logo, and the brand prestige tells you you have to buy something. That's all about that. So Pongo is a cold brew coffee and tea company. And there's very few products in it, but it's the new cold brew trend. And actually, I worked on this for all, almost over a decade. Um, with a, where is my, my patent pending, I actually invented a machine that creates cold brew. So I have a patent pending, uh, patent in the patent office, pending. And it's hydrodynamic uh, process. So I can't disclose a lot more about it than that, but it's, it has to do with technology and being able to create a whole new level of cold brew. How many of you guys have had cold brew coffee or tea? Yeah, okay. Come down to the shop and try this new one. Um, this machine actually extracts a lot more flavor. Okay, a lot more flavor in a m much shorter time than conventional cold brews. So you know how the cold brew coffees are pretty bitter? Okay, this has no bitterness. It's all sweet and creamy, naturally. 
no additives whatsoever. And the teas are obviously only tea and water, but you don't get any astringency and you get a lot of flavor in your palate. Uh, so it answers to the pure, natural, healthy market and also answers to the taste market. So you know, this product applies to both the gourmet and the health markets. So mass market, right? This is the latest bottle, so you can probably find that in Whole Foods or other supplies that we will in a relatively short time. So that's my machine. And now we're talking about production. So unlimited, right? You can control how much you produce, and you're not having to travel 5,000 miles to get tea leaves. Uh, we're still buying extremely you know, high-end tea leaves, but at a much more mass quantity level. Okay, because this is for making cold brew, so your ingredient is not at the same quality level as what I have at the shop, it's still very high end. So with production, you have a whole new set of challenges. You set up your factory, um, your factory cells, and you know, your uh, FDA compliance, you know, lots of compliance. So it's a whole new world, but it's very simple. It's relatively a simple process. And then you look at your competitors. You guys have seen some of these brands that are early adapters, right? How many of you guys had Blue Bottle? Yeah, yeah that's everybody. Uh, Chameleon brand? Black Medicine? Any of those? Stumptown? Everybody? Yeah. So that's what we're looking at. Those are our competitors. Yeah, so you identify you know, the handful of competitors that are out there. Because basically, it's a product that will go to a mass audience, meaning supermarkets. And there's only so much shelf space, so you're competing for shelf space. So are they going to give three slots to Stumptown, five slots to Blue Bottle, and give you one slot, like me, if you're a new product? Or how do you get to five slots okay, that the supermarket will support you, being a new brand? You know, it's a chicken and egg thing, because if you only see you know, one slot or two slots, two products, and you've never seen Fog Dog before, and if I weren't telling you that it's such a great product, you probably won't pick it up, right? You probably pick up something you're familiar with, like Blue Bottle or Stumptown. So those are some of the challenges that has to be overcome with competition. But then you look at your market size, and uh, you look at where the, where the market is, and which areas you need to distribute to. So we're focused mainly on the most caffeinated cities in the country right now, which are the number one most caffeinated city in the country. Yes, no. Seattle, bing, win price. Seattle is the most caffeinated city, but we haven't, that's, that's down the road since we're in the Bay Area, so we started the Bay Area. San Francisco is like number three. I think New York is like number two. So we're currently in New York and San Francisco. Um, but it's a pretty sizable market, uh, ready to drink coffee, one billion. This is just the US. Okay, so, and then cold coffee, 24% of that. But to start your business at this scale, you know, you need to go out the gate. You can't grow organically. So you need funding. And that's where the tedium of getting funding happens. Um, where do you get your funding? Out of your own pocket? Yeah, sure. You can do that up to a certain extent. Um, friends and family, until they don't return your calls properly. Um, but they have, you know, limited resources. And, you know, there's a certain amount of risk with uh, starting a new business. So you don't want to subject too many of your friends and family to it, right? And they don't always know what they're investing in. They're just putting money in your company because they're your family. So that's not a supportable long-term plan to start a business. It's OK for maybe the first month. Uh, is it bankable? It's not, because no new businesses are really bankable. You can, you can bank on accounts receivables. You can bank on, you know, if you have your machine leases and things like that. But generally, you're not bankable. So then angel investors are your next best bet, right? You guys have heard all this in business school. That go to business school. Angel investors, basically professional investors that um, invest in the early stage of a business and they hope to turn it over as soon as you get VC funding, venture capital funding. And that's when they make money. So if they invested, let's say, a million dollars into your company, they hope that you, attract, you grow fast enough and you attract the attention of VC funding 
which will, they will probably give you another 10 million. And so that's when the angel investor cashes out. So they're like an early, higher risk seed investor. Um, so attracting VC funding, it's all about you know, valuation. How much do you think your company's worth? You always think your company's worth a lot more than they think it's worth. So getting to that point of a VC putting money into your company. But once they do that, you do grow at a very fast trajectory. Um, nowadays, you have circle up and crowdfunding, you know, those kind of things. I'm not in favor of those because because of the technology and the patent pending, I don't want to disclose too much uh, information that's put out in the public. Nowadays, everything is public, right? Everything's on LinkedIn. Um, so crowdfunding is not my favorite method of venture capital um, type funding. The circle up and some other ones. So basically, we're on this uh, angel investor and VC funding stage right now and putting out product. Any questions? Much more boring than the other business, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I know that you wouldn't want to disclose too much about the way that you make it that's different, but are you planning on marketing um, the drinks in a way that that d make, makes you different, or are you just relying yeah. on the fact that like people will taste the difference? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. Marketing, definitely. Um, and also, they will definitely taste the difference because we've done a lot of blind tasting already with consumers. Um, getting them to taste it for the first time takes marketing, but once they've tasted it, they become repeat customers. Uh, we're already selling in New York, so that's already happened. So there's a lot of repeat business there. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, with this kind of business, you have to. It's it's a standard pathway, basically. You know, it's been done before. People have put out beverages before. They put out lines of different kinds of food and beverage. So you're plugging into a market that's developing. It's not a brand new market because the coffee and tea industry, the convenient coffee and tea industry, is already in existence. So the person that reaches for the tea bag, if they could get a bottle of tea that's much more excellent than what they can get out of the tea bag, but very convenient as well, and cold brew, which has you know, all the other benefits associated with it that you don't get from hot tea. Um, so you're plugging into an existing market. You're also plugging into a business plan that have already been in existence. You know, this pathway is not was not created by me. This is how most uh, food and beverage or most businesses um, develop. So, in in a lot of ways, much easier. So I have the free time to do both. Right? So now instead of 12 hours, I work 16 hours. <coughs> Um, so right now you're working on both businesses, but how do you see the future of the answers? You will become more and more involved with this new business. Who is going to take on your role in your first business? The first business is more mature, and I have staff that have been with me for a long time. So the store manager's been there for <coughs> over 10 years, for example. So they're running it pretty well without me being you know, on top of it constantly. So they would be the ones traveling and finding... I still have to do that. I, I don't have a replacement. I wish there was, but there isn't. Yeah. There's no one to replace me for the tea buyer position. I tried to groom people, but um, there's a language barrier, there's a cultural barrier, there's the um, ability besides the palate. I and mean, even if you can train them well enough to be discerning tea buyers, there's a lot of cultural issues that they don't understand how to develop a good relationship with these farmers. And, um, and, and no, they don't sell to foreigners really well. So if you look completely foreign, it's a little more difficult. I've seen some uh, Russian buyers, you know, and I end up translating for them. They, they have limited English, and I have zero Russian, but I end up translating for them. So very difficult. At, at that level, if you're buying mass market teams, that's a different, different situation. Um, so that's kind of what I want to share about my, my businesses and some of my obstacles and uh, trajectory and, and pathway to growth. Uh, any questions besides all the great questions you guys already asked? Yes. Um, when you first started Fiance from your corporate position, how was it like transport? Did you go all in on your new business, or you know, our last speaker sort of talked about doing both simultaneously, and then once yeah. one started to pick up, moving into it and taking like minimal risk, how how was your path? Um, I did do that as well, you know, kind of transition 
face out one to the other and spend a little less time, a little less time. Um, but I believe that if I had jumped in both feet, it probably would have taken less time. You know, after all, I started in 2002, and this is our 12th year, 14 years. Yeah, so I really allowed it to grow slowly and organically, and working double time, which is yeah. not fun. Yeah. You have to be prepared to work really hard to be an entrepreneur, but it's really fun in a lot of ways. Uh, it's very creative. It's about problem solving, and it always starts, it always helps if it starts with a passion of some kind. You, know, you have to really believe in whatever it is that you want to do, the product that you, you have that's unique, or your own special skill set. You know, something you're really excited about to, to work this hard towards. Right? Because it is hard work. But the hard work is much less if you actually have a product you believe in strongly. And then you find a lot of fun and creativity and meaning, you know. Um, meaning, meaning is very important for me personally because I was able to you know, connect to a much larger community of officiate models that I would have not connected to in the past. Um, people that really believe and love our product and love our teas and have really adapted the tea lifestyle and have become extremely proficient at it, you know, just seeing that growth and changes in people's lifestyle um, from my business is really rewarding. So a lot of ta intangible rewards from having your own entrepreneurial business. All right, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.